Hello, and welcome to Inches and Cubes, a Warhammer 40k podcast presented by Encounter Wargaming. Our fearless hosts are me, Paul Mr. Fist Fowler, point and click Nick Coslow, and Adam Truax, the truest axe to ever axe an axe. And we'll be guiding you through our favorite parts of the hobby, so grab your cubes and come with us. Welcome to our premiere episode of the Inches and Cubes podcast. We're really excited about this. Everybody has been talking and dreaming about what this might look like. And this is why we started it. Eighth edition is coming out. There's a lot to talk about, a lot that we've been planning in the background, and a lot that uh, our armies are anticipating to see some action on the table. And so we decided to bring you guys along for this journey. Uh, Let's start off and just introduce all three of the hosts. Um, Nick, why don't you give us a little bit of your hobby resume, and then Paul after that, and then I'll tell you after that. Fantastic. So thanks for having me on, Adam. It's I'm really looking forward to being a part of this. I know I've been part of Encounter Wargaming's bat reps. Uh, I am the president of Hogtown 40K as well, so all of the aspects of the hobby are just tying together fantastically. I've been playing Warhammer for about 15 years now. It started way back when I got some secondhand models from one of those old terrible late 90s comic book stores in the suburbs <laughs> and me and my brother used to throw dice at each other's models and try to knock them down uh, around high school I started getting more into it started playing at the old battle bunker in Oakville if anyone remembers that place it's a beautiful beautiful place 60 tables great tournaments um, when Games Workshop actually cared and now guess what they're back to caring and it's come first full circle and it's wonderful it is yeah I like it So I mainly play Chaos. I play Emperor's Children in 30k, Horus Heresy, or Horacy. Um, I also use that army in 40k to represent uh, Chaos Space Marines with a focus on Noise Marines. Uh, Nobody likes the Noise Marines in either game, except for me, but that's fine. (laughs) Recently I started a Death Watch army, branched off from my usual Chaos roots. Really like the idea of Special Forces Space Marines. It's kind of a cool idea. And I also played Orcs for a long time as well. Uh, Just the goofiness of literally running headlong into somebody is hilarious. I'm a huge fan of the fluff. I love listening to the podcasts, the audio dramas, the books, and just generally just talking with my buds here about some of the hilarious stuff that exists in the fluff universe of Warhammer 40k. Uh, So I'm going to throw it over to Paul. Paul. Uh, Yeah, so... Uh, I've been in the hobby maybe like 16 years. Or you just had to beat me by yeah, one. Yeah, just by one. Okay. That's, yeah. Um, my my first army was actually a Imperial Guard uh, regiment. It was Mordians. They were painted terribly, um, which is funny because painting is now my favorite part of the hobby. Currently, I play Necrons, though they're not getting a ton of love right now. I'm really excited for eight to see what happens with them. Uh, Like Nick, I have a a dual-purpose 40k, 30k army. It's uh, a nicely painted, I think, Imperial Fist army. It is indeed. It's it's beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, And I'm currently adding a couple of uh, Legio Custodes units, just because I think that's going to be nice and fluffy. Uh, I like when, in the lore, uh, the Imperial Fist and the Legio Custodes work together. It's cool, and they're just giant super engineer space marines what's not to love with like spear guns like try to explain a spear gun and like not be like that is the coolest thing i've ever heard of i do have one question for you though okay can you please tell me the name of one custodes uh val or Everdeath. <laughs> <laughs> they'll get names they do have names they're just like three pages long yeah they have like 99 names um, I didn't know that. Fact yeah, of the day. Yeah. yeah, you just get like new names for being cool. It's like, oh, you did something cool. You're also Alexander on top of Adam Truex, or you're Adam Truex Alexander now. Adam Truex Alexander Paul Nick. <laughs> this way, one day I'll tell you guys my middle name. Ooh. Spoilers. Francis. Uh, Good guess, but wrong. Yeah, now's not the time. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's my uh, hobby resume. Also, I like making terrain. It's fun to do, and it helps at our club. Uh, but I think Adam has a bunch to say about what he does. Yeah, so I've been I've been in this hobby for 20 years. I started when I was 10 years old with a space orc army as well. Thought it was hilarious. A buddy of mine invited me over to his house, and uh, my dad came home one day with a box of those squatty goth boys. 
Um, do you yes. remember this? I do, yeah. <clears throat> there you go. So Pistol in one hand, axe in the other, yeah. and the German pith helmet. <laughs> Right. They're all exactly the same. You want to hear something? When I first got into the hobby, uh, we I was like buying blisters from this place in St. John's, and we're idiots, and we're like 13 or whatever, and everyone was pronouncing knobs as nobiz. <laughs> so like, it'd be like, yeah, these are my snake bite nobiz. It's like, that doesn't make sense. That is no- that does, That's nothing. <laughs> so yeah, those were we were like the dumb thirteen year old kids at the store. That's awesome. And me as a as a ten year old kid at the time got a pack of Storm Boys and you know the metal plastic combinations and all the arms would always fall off because they're attached to a plastic body. Ugh, terrible. Um, so anyways, I've progressed on to many many armies since then. Um, but what I play currently uh, is Sisters of Battle. That's my main jam. And Raven Guard. Been working on those guys. Uh, and for 30k, I play the Luna Wolves. Mr. Garvio Loken just stole my heart. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and when 30k became a thing, at least on my radar, I, I couldn't wait to just paint up some white space marines. And so I did. Um, but I also play other uh, games, as you guys have seen on the channel, such as Infinity and Malifaux. Heresy! <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's, my, that's my hobby resume. I also I work for Games Workshop. Um, for about four years was the manager of the Eaton Center store so shout out to all you boys at the Eaton Center who used to game down there appreciate you guys Um, and yeah so why don't we tell everybody what's coming up Um, we're going to talk about our hobby progress that includes building painting and gaming Uh, as well as our main topic today is we're going to walk through the movement phase the shooting phase and now the two combat phases for 8th edition the charge and fight phase Um, So let's jump right in. Ooh, and we have a little surprise at the end. We have a little fun activity at the end of each episode. And today I believe we're going to read you guys some fluff written by Mr. Paul Fowler. Yeah, I'm a big nerd and I write a bunch of weird nerd stuff. Yeah, so at the end of every episode we're going to try and do something fun, a little bit different, something we want to get across to you guys, but don't really know where it fits into the overall structure. (laughs) So that could be a vigorous debate. It could be some fluff reading. Or it could just be us arguing about stats and uh yeah the community in general so you might one day hear nick get punched in the nuts we're not sure uh anyways let's jump into our (laughs) hobby progress uh i'll go first so just recently i have painted up my triumvirate of the Apurian and triumvirate of the primarch a lot of fun except mr robot girly man has way too much gold trim that's what so I much like why does he look like a thousand sun model because his armor's keeping him alive okay so why between horus heresy and current like 40k timeline did he go from looking like Lawrence olivier to dolph lundgren like, skulls oh you're right yes yeah, there's, there's more skulls in this armor yeah i've counted them there's 36 get the hell no i didn't count them. but there's <laughs> none on his first stuff yeah like that, sorry to steal it. But that, right. that has been bothering me about that model. I think it's a like mostly cool model, but the the forty k one just that the the base should be the same. He's also huge. Yeah, he should be huge. Like he's it's like he's been in the gym for ten thousand years, just lifting weights. Now nah, he's just been lying around, <laughs> lazy. Uh, so Saint Celestine was also really fun to paint. <laughs> Adam has a weird obsession with characters who come back to life annoyingly. Apparently, yeah, mm-hmm. that's right. Um, so Saint Celestine, just uh, and I'll tell I'll talk later when I talk about my games, but she is she's so much better in the game, and I love it. Um, so I had to get that box this, the second it came out, um, and then I'm not sure yet what I'm gonna do with the Grey Knight guy, but they're all painted, so I've got them sitting around, and, and we'll see what they do in Eighth Edition. Um, Paul, what have you been up to, man? Uh, so we Nick and I went to Astro uh, a few weeks ago. And for that, I needed to get a bunch of models ready for the first company uh, task force detachment. So for that, I ended up painting a bunch of Sturdengard that are going to pull double duty in my uh, 30k army as just, you know, veterans. So it's uh, four guys with uh, combi plasma and in a rhino. Uh, Which combi is getting infinitely better, but that's for a future episode. <laughs> what yeah. color is their armor, Paul? They're, all right, so I painted them in the assault company colors that's in book three three of the Horus Heresy because I didn't want to shoot myself before Astro because that would really hamper my games. This was a really well uh, scripted response <laughs> because Nick has been pestering Paul about this for a while. <laughs> yeah, since I since I was like, I need to save time, I have painted an entire army yellow. I, it has driven me up a wall. But... What is worth? White or yellow, though? Uh, 
both are bad. No, I couldn't imagine doing it. You you do the white Marines. You do the yellow Marines. Yeah, because we're masochists, oh. apparently. Um, but I with those, I had a lot of fun building them. I mixed in um, upgrade sets from Forge World. Uh, Blood Angels helmets. The the they have this like really cool knightly look to them, and mixing that with the uh, the Iron Hands bionics that came out just made a really characterful unit. Um, so that was a ton of fun, and I was also able to dig out an old Severin Loth model and add like some modifications to him, just to use as my HQ for that. And I, you know, everyone's rolling around in a rhino, so there was like a Demos rhino painted in the Assault Company colors. Uh, again, black is easier, but I did yellow doors, so it all makes sense. And Nick, what have you been working on? Well, like Paul said, him and I went to Astro, uh, and about, I think it was like two months ago at this point, we did the Kill Team event, where Hogtown 40K did one build and paint night, where people were encouraged to build a small force to play in a Kill Team tournament. So I started off doing Death Watch. I painted five models and a rhino to get ready for that event. There's a video, actually. There is a video. Yes, there is. You can see Nick being real proud about building Death Watch. I painted them myself, okay? (laughs) I was proud of them. Uh, So I decided to expand that into a 1,500-point list to bring to Astro. Um, Five Terminators, 20 Vets, uh, Corvus Blackstar. Not a lot of fun to paint. The line highlighting black gets carpal tunnel after a while hey man that's how I make a living <laughs> oh, painting gray lines on black miniatures <laughs> yeah but they came out looking really good I was quite impressed with them um, <clears throat> a couple special characters in there as well I got a lot of the models from the Death Watch Overkill set and those models are just fantastic they're, that Overkill set yeah. is <clears throat> worth every penny yeah they're unique uh, they're the sculpts are fantastic and when I did my Death Watch I decided I'm not going to make any two models alike so every single model, even if they have the same war gear, different poses, different sets, I grabbed stuff from Betrayal at Kalf, some Forge World bits I had lying around, even some Chaos bits that I had and just modified them a bit just to give them a cool little custom feel. Um, I was very impressed that you hand sculpted all your bases. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, I did not. No. The bases yeah. are were fantastic. Your, dis- your display yeah. base, was it? I forget. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, I didn't bring that to Astro. I uh, I didn't have time. I got the alien infection or alien infestation bases from Secret Weapon Miniatures, and oh man, they were fantastic. Uh, yeah, they did them really. in different layers of purple, and they looked straight out of like a Tyranid Hive world. So I was quite impressed with them. But then I was left with the problem of how do I make a display board <laughs> for this alien thing? And with school and life in general, I just didn't have time. Um, which is a shame because I would have actually probably placed a couple points higher at Astro yeah. just for having a display board. But the display board gets you two points total. Um, that's it for me, though. Adam, besides your usual um, what you do for a living, what have you been working on? Oh, yeah. yeah, so, well, I, you know, I did my, my hobby stuff, so let's do games. So I've played a couple games, um, been recording them for the channel, so you guys have uh, maybe seen those, and if not, you can go check them out. I have recorded uh, my Sisters of Battle on using the Castellans of the Imperium Detachment. I've had a lot of fun with this, just dreaming about what the detachment could be, ultimately, because um, there are a lot of choices. You can choose from any Imperial uh, army book that's out there, pretty much. Um, and so this isn't a, a truly optimized list for Castellans, <laughs> but it's a pretty fun one with the models that I had. Um, and so I played two games. So one is against kind of a, a chaos Death Star involving four sorcerers on bikes, some kind of silly corn lord, and a whole bunch of the corn uh, bloodhound doggy dudes. Nothing says corn like I, sorcerers. No. That's it. That's right. <laughs> And, and an Imperial Knight to boot. I shouldn't. Uh, this, some people don't care about that as much as I do. <laughs> so that's the game that I played. Um, and thankfully we did just straight up 40k rulebook missions. And we played um, uh, Maelstrom. And so I was just a little bit more mobile. I just managed to claim more objectives and accomplish more of the objectives that the cards pulled out. And so pulled out a victory on that. Um, what I did learn, though, is, is more about how the Castellan's detachment work, and I was, I was really happy 
um, to kind of get my feet wet with that, with the troops coming back to life, with everything having hatred. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, using new Celestine, uh, forgetting her orbital bombardment. Yes, it's good learning point. She has an orbital bombardment. She does. It's I'm assault. just getting. I'm just getting angrier. Yeah. Wouldn't matter. If she has a jetpack. She'd be relentless. But oh, mm, not. She has a jump pack. Makes her relentless. Really? Oh man. Yeah. yeah amazing. Dude, saints have orbital bombardment. It only orbital makes sense. Bomb. Yeah. Is it from a spaceship or from God? Whatever you the want. The God Emperor. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the God Emperor spaceship. Again, heresy. <laughs> so then I also played against a Nurgle army. Um, it was primarily all on foot, just Death Guard. Uh, some of them were in rhinos, but for the most part, it was just a bunch of infantry on foot. I approve. It, it was fabulous. Um, great game against my buddy Liam uh, at his house. We had a lot of fun putting it on camera. Um, but Celestine, I was so disappointed with her this game, she failed three, count it, three uh, hit and run rolls in a row. And so I just could not get out of fighting these stupid Death Guard Marines to flame her other stuff or to, to get around and get some other Maelstrom objectives. And she was just stuck there. And it was, it was just infuriating. And I think ultimately that that was one of the linchpins uh, that lost me the game on that one. Liam was so happy he messaged me right after the game to tell, tell me <laughs> that you had failed three in run rolls. Oh. Well, I'm glad he had a good time. I, we both had a great time, but uh, I'm glad he especially had a good time. Awesome. Uh, hey, Paul, what have you been playing and doing? I know you guys had some big events. Yeah, uh, so like I said, we were at uh, Astro, which is a, uh, a tournament uh, that's run by, oh God, what are their names? I, you know. uh, Mike and Christian. They're, yeah. uh, they're both XGW employees that did game testing, painting. They're, they know how to run an event. Yeah, these guys are, if you ever have the like distinct pleasure of meeting them, do that. Oh, they're fantastic yeah, guys. A yeah, a real credit to the hobby. Like You can tell this is a labor, labor of love sort of event. Um, the, the games, every table has its own custom scenario, so it might be something uh, like Fight Night, which is two knights fighting, and you're in the middle of it, so good luck with that. That's or, hilarious. Oh, it's... Yeah, it, it's... Because they're attacking each other, but then if you shoot them, one of them turns around. Goes after the unit that shot it. It's all aggro. Oh, it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I love that one. That just feels like a video game level to me. Then uh, there's my favorite one that I played is uh, capturing chaos cultists. So there's a third force on the board. They act independently, and uh, you're you need to like fight them in close combat and capture them, and then they kind of act like the relic. But they're fighting back. Yeah, they are fighting back. Uh, in that game, I had the plasma gunner just snipe a tactical sergeant because I, you know, positioned them wrong and this plasma gunner just was like, zap. But the worst part is you're rolling the own dice, so you're just, like, doing it to yourself. Um, that game was good. It was against a uh, a guy who's playing a Gene Stealer Cult, and I do find that that is a really slow army to play because there's so many special rules. There's a lot of, like... Uh, deployment shenanigans that happen at the start of the game and then continue throughout the game, this guy did a really solid thing and printed out cards with all of those special rules and like all the randomized tables so he had it there as reference sheets. This guy did his homework and I really respect that and that is like a thoughtful thing to do. This was the guy who had the sewer display board, right? Yeah, yeah. just one of the most, uh, like the amount of work that he put in on his models, like really cool. The actual uh, fluff behind this army is it was based on the strain. I don't know if you like you're familiar with that science fiction thing. I know you like the strain. Oh, I love the strain. Vampires. Vampires. Or gene stealers. Or gene. Same same thing, right? Yeah. 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 Blood stealer, gene stealer, <laughs> potato potato. Um, and then the one of the other games that I absolutely loved, where I was bringing my uh, imperial fists, I was uh, up against some crimson fists, so it really felt like um, you know schooling some young upstarts. And this was on a really dense. Uh, urban uh, table so they kind of the this mission was set up as city fight light so everyone got to pick a stratagem uh, per side I ended up picking one that gave uh, a unit feel no pain because this ruin was now it used to be a hospital so I guess drugs that you find in an abandoned building are things you should do or doctors well, they just follow you around yeah, yeah don't do doctors they're people or do no they help you oh yeah. Okay. I don't know what drugs are going to do if you have a missile sticking out of your chest. Cool. Well, I guess. We'll yeah. talk about it later. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, that one was good. Uh, the fire raptor that I brought to this tournament did crazy amounts of work. Uh, that is, it's sometimes a bummer to explain what is happening to a unit when that thing flies on. <laughs> and you, yeah, you got to understand. I've I've been using one against Paul for a very long time, and finally I sold him my second one, and he just giggles when he uses it. Oh my god, it's so much fun. Um, the Avenger bolt cannon just nopes out tactical squads like strength eight, six, six AP three. So it's like the only thing it's missing is it ignores cover. Yeah, yeah. Well, I need fire shit. Anyways, uh, but yeah, that was that was a great game overall. I went like five or uh, fifty fifty win loss, which is you know statistical for me. I like to sit in the middle of the pack. That's where I'm most comfortable. Well done, sir. Yeah. Uh, well done. Also, I managed to win best single painted miniature. It was the hair. It yes. was the hair. I sculpted on some hair to a tactical sergeant, and he looked like a surfer. Uh, so yeah, it was... It took home the prize. I did. Just a single infantry, yeah. and I heard there were many very large models in that. Yeah. Very flashy. Yeah. A lot of things going on, and he took it with just a single infantry. Well, his, his acceptance speech was, was just perfect. Oh, God. I was... One, super hungover, and then, like, terrified that, like, I won this thing with a tactical sergeant, so I was like, this crowd's gonna eat me alive. <laughs> like, I better say something, and, like, I'm sure it was idiotic. I think I said, like, at the end, it was like, simple done well, beats complex every time, and, like, there are people... Nobody clapped. Nobody clapped. Because <laughs> like, there are people that, like, airbrushed, like, <clears throat> design stencils, like, you know, freehand stuff, and I was just like, yeah, well, this guy just looks good. <laughs> the humble beast. Well, That's I what we call Paul. Who will rename you the humble, <laughs> the humble beast? beast. <laughs> well, I just I don't know. I wanted to like showcase the basics. Like if you do neat and like color in the lines and do one or two advanced techniques. That's it, man. I'm you're, done with your you're so you're so humble, man. So. Your your imperial fists just look absolutely fantastic. It's like you said, it is simple, done well. Yeah. But it's it's your weathering. Mm-hmm. That's what really brings them above the pack. Like you're. You got the hobby stuff on lockdown, man. No one can weather like you. I mean, sponges. Sponges and powders. They're going to help you out. Like, you know, some people think that it's like, oh, it's sort of like hacky or tricky, but like, it's a technique. And if it's stupid and it works. That's why Batman wears a belt. He has all the different <laughs> yeah. tools on it. Exactly. Yeah. You never know when you need sharper pellet. <laughs> so those those were the games that I played. Nick, how did you uh, how did you fare up at Astro? I love Astro. I've gone for five years now. And I'm just going to take a couple seconds before I go into my games to just do a couple shout-outs to some of the amazing armies that were present. If anyone here is familiar with the story of Tuska the Demon Killer, it has to be one of my favorite fluff pieces. Yes! Yeah, Paul knows what I'm talking about. So this orc war boss gets sucked into the Eye of Terror, ends up on a corn demon world, and it's basically Valhalla for orcs. Corn is so impressed with their fighting abilities that they every time they die... The next morning, they're reborn to fight more corn orcs. And this guy came to Astro with an entire demon army made up of orcs. He had orcs painted pink for pink horrors. He had, he actually had Tuska the demon killer himself. And he had Bell Orcor instead of Bellacor. <laughs> there you go. The, uh, the gene stealer guy that Paul played had this... Sector Imperialis display board, which was just the surface streets, and then when you lifted it up, his entire army was underneath it in the sewers. Yeah, it was such a... Disco scene. lights playing, music. Um, kind of like a Ninja Turtles type thing going on. Very much a, a Ninja Turtles type thing. And there were just fantastic uh, armies, display boards. The Tusca one actually was riding a styrofoam wave of blood that was three feet high. Yeah, it was... Crazy. Like, I have some pictures. We can post pictures. Yeah, we have that capability. Sure. Yeah, there's always capabilities. Yeah, yeah. We so. can build it. <laughs> we have the technology. We do. If we build it, they will come. <laughs> yeah, no, just absolutely fantastic time. Like I said, five years. Um, this time I wanted to bring something different. So, like I said before, I brought out my Death Watch. Just a few standout games. I played a couple of our own club members, actually, from Hogtown 40K. My first game was versus Mackenzie. Um, well, we know him. You guys don't yet. You will one day. He's he been brought, on the channel. He, he played, has been on the channel. He played Eldar on the channel. So the all the way uh, battle port. From oh, that's very right, yeah. Check it out. Yeah. So that was our my, our, my first game. Uh, he was playing Gene Stealer Cult. Much like Paul said, it's a very slow army to play against. Um, the mission I was playing at was about maybe 12 objectives. There are little crystal formations on the board. And 
If you held them at the end of the game, it gave you a bonus to your final score. Then you mathed it out and figured out who won. I ended up winning that game. It was a tough game, but uh, Gene Steeler Cult, awesome list, really cool rules, still die like guardsmen. <laughs> That's all I have to say about that. Heroically? Heroically. Not even though. We could just change the phrase to, they just die like Gene Steeler Cult. They just die like Gene Steeler Cult. They go, surprise, and they get oh, shot in the face. Man, one of the most fun things about that tournament is like just catching a like poorly deployed Gene Steeler Cult unit. Because you're like, oh, bolters, do what you do, and you're just like, brap. Oh, yeah. I think in one of our games, he like got the roll and the deployment that allowed him to do a free charge, and then failed the charge. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so you just turn around, and you're like, okay. So that game was fun. Um, I also played against a really cool Blood Angels army. It was really heavily mechanized. Lots of Predators, Land Raiders, Dreadnoughts. Um, got tabled. That's pretty quickly like a flashback to fourth edition it was like, very much a fourth edition it was, i think it was the new blood angels one from uh uh Exterm- the, no, what's the book angels of death no no the, the, the one with the necrons the gathering no, the gathering storm one the one that part one or part two it's the blood angel specific like campaign yeah, supplement no, it's not book. gathering storm that one is uh i think it's exterminatus or something like that it's the one angels where, blade yeah where they team up with necrons no Anyways. <laughs> anyways, 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 um, so all of his tanks had overcharged engines, and the, the mission is one of my favorite missions. It didn't work in my favor this time. Essentially, you're in an orc scrapyard, and there's scrap piles all over the place, and you have to bring the scrap piles to the scrapyard dealer, who's in the middle of the board, to make a deal. Grotmar? Yes. <laughs> but the scrap dealer has guard dogs, who are actually guard squigs, who murdered four out of my five Terminators in combat. <laughs> And just made that loss sting so much more. Oh, you gotta stop rolling once. Uh, no, they had rending. <laughs> <laughs> Which it's a game, I it's was, a game of cubes. It's a game yeah, of cubes. It's a game of cubes. And they have like three attacks on the charge, so you just see those sixes and you're like, oh no. This is, a thir- this is a third party army and I'm dying. Uh, played a couple good games against two marine armies. A Dark Angels army with a two upper rollable jinx save. Which I put in its place with frag cannons, because frag cannons fix everything. Well, like, the, the two up re-rollable Jinx save is, like, such a one... Not a one-trick pony, but, like... It's a one-trick pony. It's a re-rollable one-trick pony. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's <laughs> statistically, like, a 2 and 0.8 trick pony. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, like, it's... It does have a hard counter that exists, so, like, good yeah. luck. Like, yeah. take it, but, like, you know, buyer beware sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. just hope you don't face frag cannons. Yeah, yeah. frag cannons, blast masters, all that fun stuff. Uh, I'll play another one of our club members who did bring Blastmasters. Um, I stole the initiative on him and kind of put him on his back foot. He brought the new Raptor Talon formation from the Trader Legion's book. He was running Emperor's Children, which gives you a lot of awesome bonuses. Combat drugs. If you die in combat before you strike, you get to strike one attack at your normal strength. So some fun stuff going on there. Um, I was the defender in that mission, so I basically just had to hold him off, which I was able to do and pulled out a win. Played a beautifully painted Black Templar's army. Um, Lots of neophytes mixed in with the tactical marines. Super fluffy, super fun to play against. Um, Really showing how weak dreadnoughts are. I just remember... Like, he comes down with this venerable dreadnought, hops out of a drop pod, I fire one missile at him, and he's immobilized, and he stands there and does nothing for the rest <laughs> of the Immobilized yeah. dreadnought's yeah. the worst. <laughs> I think he had, like, the, um, oh, the, like, the super-duper heavy flamer. Oh, the... Hellstorm cannon? Sure. Something. Yeah. Yeah. Some powerful, and it was just like, well, I'm just gonna stay eight inches away from you. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, my second game, but we're gonna talk about this last, because it's got me super salty even a couple weeks later. I had the uh, misfortune of facing a Yunari army. So Yunari is the Eldari, Eldar, Dark Eldar combined army. Um, And as we all know, Eldar is already extremely powerful. And coupling them with Dark Eldar in the same detachment with the Soulburst special rule, I just literally lost half my army without even rolling a single dice. It was a little disheartening. Um... Soul Burst was a big surprise. I didn't realize it was going to be that good. 
So for anybody who doesn't know, soul burst is when a unit dies within a certain range of one of these Eldari units, they get to, uh, out of a list of options, do a number of things, either move again or shoot again uh, or charge. It's just crazy. Like yeah. you just exponentialize the potential of your units, and not not to mention with the certain formation he was running, if a unit dies and it's not a friendly unit or an enemy unit, it's, it's any unit. unit, then two units within seven inches can make a free action. Yeah. So basically, the game can be summed up in the first twenty seconds of the game. He brings a fire uh, fire dragon squad down with an archon with a webway portal, no scatter. Blows up a rhino, uses that rhino's soul. I know, don't ask me. Rhino. This guy's like a hardwired pilot. I pilots. guess. The pilots. The pilots. The pilots. The pilots. I well, suppose. The drivers, yes. Uh, and then pilots. kills all the guys inside without me rolling a single dice. From the soul burst action. Yeah. From the soul burst action. Yeah. Uh, he had planes that were just like, oh, that guy on the ground died. My plane's going to shoot. And you're like, that doesn't even make sense. No, I feel like the soul burst shouldn't affect... Like, most rules shouldn't affect flyers. Like, yeah. they're at, I don't know, probably the lowest they fly is yeah. like 4,000 feet. You know, maybe 600 feet. You're not going to get, like, a soul flying in and then you're all juiced up on afterlife and just blow up another dude. Like, <laughs> well, we're really talking about the realism of the game here. <laughs> with souls and airplanes and Eldar. All right, all right, the game, cool. it was the same scenario that Paul talked about earlier with the cultists running around the board and again my terminators didn't do well this tournament but i actually lost i think three or four of them to the random plasma gunners running Mm -hmm. around the board sniping them off which was again not the best game but overall i had such a great tournament it was a really really as we're talking about we're uh we're moving towards the end of seventh and into eighth and i think it was just like the piece de resistance of seventh edition it outlined a lot of the problems going on but uh, you approach it with the right attitude and you just have fun no matter whether you win or lose. That's right. And so Nick's explanation of the Unari is everything that we are frustrated and annoyed with with 7th. Um, and so we're really excited to move into 8th. And so that's going to be our main topic uh, for the podcast. And so right before we jump into it, here's a quick word from our sponsors. These are people who love the hobby and want to enhance your gaming experience by either offering a product or a service. Check it out. Hello. Do you like having fun more than winning games? No, nobody likes that. But I'm a better painter than I am a player. Then Hogtown 40K is the club for you. This club is for people to meet and share ideas and promote all aspects of Warhammer 40k. We host hobby events from building and painting evenings, low pressure tournaments, and random pub nights. Look us up on Facebook, Hogtown 40k. We're obnoxious about being bad at Warhammer. Battle Brothers Studios, a commissioned painting service passionate about making your miniatures and your gaming table look great. Our philosophy at Battle Brothers is this, your army is our army. Every model will be something you can be proud to show off. Send us a message on facebook.com slash battlebrothersstudios for a free quote and make that dream project come to life. We also have something special planned for the release of 8th edition of 40K. Right now, get 20% off if you commission us to paint an 8th edition starter set or get a 10% off army bundle bonus for painting up your new 8th edition 40k army inquire with us on facebook for full details so here we are in our main segment uh as we've all seen online uh, the gw community has been releasing some great content about the new edition of 40k um we're going to talk about this over the next few weeks um certain articles that they've been releasing we're going to kind of recap them and then talk about our thoughts around how we think that's going to impact the game um and so for this episode we're going to cover movement shooting and the two different combat phases Uh, these will be a little bit out of sequence from the order that they've come out in um, but we've kind of packaged them in a way that we think is nice and succinct um, so that you guys can get all of sim- all the similar types of content in the same episode. Yeah, before we dive into that, I just want to do a huge shout out to Games Workshop. <clears throat> in the past couple months, they have done an absolutely fantastic job 
of really involving the community and really building up excitement for 8th edition. All the new releases are just, the hype is there, the teaser trailers are there, and I feel like a kid in a candy store. No, I don't I'm know excited. about you guys. I'm really excited about 8th edition. Yeah. Everything, I, I it's going to be some hardcore change, but man, I'm, I'm pumped and I'm stoked and I hope you guys are too. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Just, uh, it, I think the biggest thing I like about this is that it is a distinct uh, addition. It's not like... Um, 6.5. Yeah. Because yeah. like from 5 to 6 to 7, I don't think I can tell you what changed when. I think it was just some like very minor tweaks to special rules. But like 8th, now it's like, no, we were going to burn down some like long-standing things and build them back up in a new, different, better configuration. Well, let's tear them down. If we burn them down, we can't really build them back up. Tear them down, build them back up. Okay. Well, Less arson, more construction. <laughs> <laughs> Noted. And that's why I got fired from a construction job. Actually. What? <laughs> can't talk about it. So, Hot fingers, Paul. <laughs> Uh, so all that to say, thank you, Games Workshop, for you guys are doing a great job, and thank you for making our hobby and our free time super exciting and fun and awesome. Um, so shall we talk about movement? This is this is the first one we're going to cover, um, and the way we'll do this, guys, is I'll just kind of throw out a fact that GW has presented about the new edition, and then we'll just talk about how we feel about it, how we think about it, and all that stuff. Um, so first thing with movement that has changed is every model has its own unique movement statistic. What do we think about this, guys? Awesome. I think this goes into the general direction Games Workshop's going with, with very, very unit-specific rules. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and I think like that goes to, like, it's just a really easy way to get uh, a character feel across an entire army. Necrons shouldn't be running at the same speed as Space Marines. Agreed. Space Marines should be outpacing Guardsmen. Like, this just... Yeah. You know, the it, it's a level of uh, nuance that I'm really looking forward to. So I think uh, 40k used to be kind of the simple game, and Fantasy was a more complex game, and this is how it was in Fantasy. Dwarves moved three inches. Yeah, I remember <laughs> that, yeah. <clears throat> and so this is going to bring a really unique feel back to 40k. So good job. Thumbs up, I think, all around on that. Next up is uh, the new run. So they call this Advance, and it's combined into the movement phase. Uh, I think it's great. It's really going to speed things up. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's going to speed things up. I mean, <clears throat> you can probably see it in some of our battle reports. I'm, a, I'm a really guilty of being like, I'm just going to run the movement phase. Yeah, I do that all the time. Like, it we just all do makes that. Sense. It makes way more sense. I only want to pick up a model once. Yeah. I, again, I think it goes to speeding the game up as well. Um, I also never really liked how um, it was the rhino screen. You guys remember the rhino screen? No. Nope. Where you like, you move a rhino up, one unit's hiding behind it, it shoots, and then the rhino flats out to hide that unit. Heck yeah, I totally do that. Yeah, exactly. You're the worst. <laughs> You're the worst. <laughs> hey, I gotta do what I can with sisters, man. Mm, fair, fair. Um, all right, so that's combined. Uh, now the last thing, this is, we're probably gonna spend a little bit of time talking about this, is the fallback move. So if you're engaged in combat, you can now, in the movement phase, move out of combat. Dun, dun, dun. So let's talk about how we feel about that, and then I have one particular note yeah. um, after. Well, it's it's now makes a gun line like more viable. Uh, as a former guard player, I have seen gun lines just get rolled up as soon as things get within six inches. As soon as you're in combat, you're like committed to that. So it's nice to be able to just back out of that and like now you're shooting again like it's it's a lot more flexible um it's especially a squishy gun line like guard yeah you yeah. just don't have or, the durability to take a charge like that but it would be interesting to see it balanced out with the uh, some of the rumors we've heard coming out with we'll get into the charge and fight phase earlier but in terms of pulling units into combats hmm. So if there's a test associated with the Fall Mac move, we haven't heard of one yet, but that would make sense, a simple leadership test. Uh, there's no such thing as initiative anymore, so yeah. can't be an initiative test, which means Adam can't fail them three times in the game. <laughs> Yoo-hoo! <laughs> um, <clears throat> but if assault is like it was in 3rd and 4th edition, where you can kind of you know win an assault and then consolidate into another assault, no, I, I, you don't think that's... No, you I, that just makes assault armies... like. 
way too good and I don't think they're gonna go back to that because I've seen horror stories where it's like a unit of corn berserkers is just like yeah that was my trick (laughs) that was my trick that was me (laughs) so there is something in the fight phase that'll come up and I'll tell you that it it does work similar to that it's gonna break my heart yes it will a little bit (laughs) start playing a shooty army Paul (laughs) let's keep to the movement phase um, do we think, and this is my special note on this, do we think that'll make shooting armies even better? Well, you're sacrificing the ability to do anything. So sometimes it's great if you're facing a really powerful close combat unit, even in 7th edition, and it charges a super shooty unit, <clears throat> you don't want that combat unit to win that combat right away right because that means that next turn that they'll be able to assault again so I think it's going to be a very tactical decision do we want to fall back and that unit does nothing so we can shoot at them or do we want to keep them tied up for a little while longer and like the thing that I keep thinking is are you going to fall back far enough and let's say you fall back your shooting doesn't kill that unit they're still in charge range so like they didn't go anywhere. <laughs> They're just coming at you faster, and they... More oh, angry. Yeah, and oh god, they have the, the, the taste of blood on their mouth. That's right. So I think what we will see is a lot of screening units around big shooty things. Um, yeah. Now, we will talk about this later in morale. Who knows? If they get charged, they may just explode. Um, <laughs> but it'll be interesting to see how this develops um, Paul why don't you talk about some of this, the shooting stuff shooting's getting a lot of changes in this new edition um, we're going to see save modifiers so AP is changing a lot Okay. instead of straight up blowing through armor it's a, uh, a negative to your armor save I kind of like this it makes a ton of sense to me um Because, you know, uh, a power armor shouldn't stand up to AP4 the same as AP5, AP6, AP dash. So, yeah, I like this one. You guys have anything about that? Well, I mean, power armor is still going to provide some level of protection against a melting gun or a plasma gun. right. Why does a plasma gun melt an Imperial Guardsman the same way it melts a Terminator? Yeah. It just, it never made sense to me. Like... You're supposed to be a literal walking tank, and you can't even deal with an anti-tank weapon. <laughs> That's right. I think it's just gonna. I think it's gonna bring the character of those heavier units right back yeah. to where it should be. Yeah, it's gonna be. It's gonna be interesting, especially mixed with uh, some of the armor save bonuses that you can get in the shooting phase as well. Yeah. So that speaks to how like cover is going to work. It's not a set uh, number like you know a crater is <clears throat> plus five. No, now a crater adds. To your armor save. Mm-hmm. So we're dealing with irrational integers now <laughs> in order to determine our final save. Yeah. You have a minus three plus two. Yeah, like this is something I don't know how much this is going to speed up the game because there is going to be like an order of operations, a string of math that you have to do before you roll a dice. Hey, die. I think it does solve the problem that, that a lot of us, a lot of us, if you sat down and you thought about armor saves and cover saves together um, that didn't make sense before. Is if a gun could punch through power armor, why couldn't it punch through this little brick wall? Yeah. yeah. Right? Or so, not just a gun, but like this orbital bombardment that is being fired from a <laughs> kilometer long battleship <laughs> that can destroy a planet. No. Yeah. No, that door was in the way. <laughs> yeah, but my guardsman jumped down in a hole. That's yeah. fine. Um, further to that, uh, smoke launchers are just getting a minus one to hit, which like really bums me out. I love the cover save. You are sad about that. I am, like, but remember now, vehicles will have armor saves. Yeah, right. So it's not. It's not the worst thing that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, and it, this is to say, like, there's no real bad changes in the shooting phase that I'm finding. One of the ones that just has me over the moon is split fire for infantry. Woo. So now you're going to have a tactical squad behaving in a tactical manner oh get out yeah like so my bolters kill orcs why am i shooting the one last cannon we brought at an orc like it'll be hilarious because you're a space marine and you're not smart enough to figure out that you can just shoot at something else all of a sudden everybody's this smart so i'm gonna blow up a truck or a thing that's not just a meat-based humanoid plant yeah or plant plant, in this example plant based they're fungus they're fun guys oh god (laughs) 
yeah. And uh, speaking again about heavy weapons, we're going to see them, uh, you know, kind of come back. Well, not come back. But we're going to see... Um, Infantry carrying them get better, at least. Yeah. yeah, so it's a minus one to hit for moving, which means heavy bolters are now, like, pretty, pretty good. I mean, yeah. they're never bad, but it's like... Have we seen the stats for them yet? Not a stat. No, for not, not for yet. heavy bolter. Okay. I no. did I did notice in one of the uh, the recent ones, they had the uh, the Tau Missile Pod one. Okay. Which so was, we'll talk about weapons in the awesome. future, but... Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's one that yeah. I like... Um, because just snap shooting weapons sort of uh, glued you to one spot if you had heavy weapons. Yeah. So this is like making the game a lot more dynamic, I feel. It's making it a lot more um, of moving pieces. And yeah, so that's something I'm really looking forward to. What about you guys? So watch out for the heavy weapons and drop pods now. Because that's going to uh, get nasty, right? Yeah. Uh, you know that's going to get nasty. Didn't think about that. Nope. nope. I think I have lots of drop pods. <laughs> and the best type of drop pods. The Dread Claws. The Dread Claws. <laughs> well, gonna, it's going to be good. Yeah. Um, yeah, like, for, I feel like for, the, the my frame of reference is always going to be a tactical squad. It makes them operate the way they should. Yes. And, you know, this is something I'm uh, super excited about. It's also cool to see that there's no shooting if an uh, enemy is one inch away from you. So that kind of means... You're de facto uh, engaged, but if you have a pistol, you can still run up and like merc somebody because yeah, yeah the pistols can yeah. shoot inside the one inch, which is really cool. Adds a lot of character to uh, to forty k in the way that it's it's a science fiction game. It's a gun game. Yeah, yeah, right? it, yeah, it really should be. And I think like the unit that's gonna see this be like really cool is Sanguinary Guard. Um, they all have those like wrist mounted pistols. That's really rad. It's where they're melt up, they're probably also going to have a couple of special rules. Mm-hmm. So Good we're gonna call. Yeah, so we're gonna see uh, multiple damage. So multi wound models are now everywhere. Uh, we you know the, the change to vehicles has been hinted at. They're gonna have wounds rather than uh, armor <gasps> or a hull points. I know Shocked. shock of shocks. So then uh, your more powerful weapons are like doing D3, D6 damage. That's a big one. Um, but it also means you're not going to like one-shot the tank, which, you know, kind of really takes the wind out of your sails sometimes. I'm, I'm still very excited about it. I mean, you should be excited about that because you play with Land Raiders. Yeah, I, I, I refuse to not play with Land Raiders. Dreads are back. Yeah, dr- an immobilized dread might not be a thing. It's not a thing. Oh, Love it. Wait. Uh, and then I think we should all take a minute to mourn the loss of templates. Uh, there's not going to be any templates. There's something know. so joyful about coming up with my seraphim with four hand flamers, laying my flamer templates out, and saying that'll be fifty hits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it is interesting. I mean, this uh, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, flame templates have been replaced by just a straight random d6 roll, <laughs> which to me really harkens back to the old. City Fight Codex. Not Cities of Death, but the yeah. City Fight Codex. I think it was 4th or 5th edition, where they actually had um, changes to the rules to allow you to fight in close quarters combat. And that was the rule for flamers. You put the flamer template down. Mm-hmm. If it touches any model in a unit, that model just takes D6 hits. Yeah. Which is a very simple way of doing it. Yeah. I mean, it, it does remove that tactile feel of the game, like, like you said. Uh, I think every... Everybody that's been playing Warhammer has that story where, like, I blew up an orc truck, and then all the orcs were packed so tightly, and then a flamer, and oh god. Lash whips. La- uh, <laughs> <laughs> less said about lash whips, the better. Um, so yeah, that's I think that is, like, an iconic part of the game that I do understand that it removing it's going to speed it up a little bit, but it's just, uh, I don't know, I'm sad to see them go. But luckily you can still use a flamer template to uh, scrape the ice off a windshield if you're ever stuck. You're such a creative guy. Well, I just yeah. want you to get the most out of your templates. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess we got to find some use for them. Exactly. Coasters. Uh, yeah. Small blast templates are now coasters. There you go. <laughs> you can't see right now, but our beers are resting on small blast templates. Um, yeah, and then after that, uh, after you shoot, what comes next, Nick? So we've actually got two different phases now, for at least from the rumors that we've heard. So we've got the charge phase and the fight phase. 
So the charge phase seems to work very similarly to it does now in 7th edition. It's a simple 2d6 random roll. Now, we're going to get into unit profiles later, but I think we're going to see a lot of special rules here that add a value to this roll. <clears throat> I don't know if fleet's still going to be a thing. Special rules are just out the window, so charging could be yeah, crazy, it's, right? It's, yeah, it's anybody's game at that point. So the, the one thing that I <clears throat> pointed out was that units like Dune Stargers, those chicken walkers for the, the Skitari, um, they could potentially charge 15 inches. So yeah, if they, keep, be, if they keep the similar rules. They might. That's right. I could see it working more towards uh, plus 3, max 12. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So you're like, more likely to get it, but yeah. you can't charge ridiculous yeah. distances. Yeah. Or you still need to be within that like charge range of 12 inches. Yeah. But yeah. 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 And then Overwatch, I think, remains very much unchanged. It's yeah. still going to be the same. Uh, there's going to be multiple Overwatch fire again. Don't really have enough information to know if it's going to work like these three units all declare three charges against that one unit simultaneously, and that one unit overwatches against all three, or if it's going to work more like seven, where it's this unit charges, it fails, the yeah. next unit can charge, get overwatched, it makes it, which means you can't overwatch against the third unit. Yeah, like my understanding is we're going to see multiple overwatches uh, from each charged unit, like as yeah. long as it's able to, as if it's not engaged. I like that. It, uh, it is another like buff to shooty armies. So, you know, we'll see. Yeah. And the... Uh, the, the one thing we do know is that if a unit tries to charge another unit, they overwatch and it fails, that unit can certainly overwatch again against the next unit that tries to charge it. Right. Yeah, that's, that's much how it is. it is now. Yeah. Yeah, which is... I'm, I'm thinking that's that, not how it is now. You get one overwatch chance. And if they fail, do you get to overwatch again? No, you have to pick, right? Oh, yeah, you do have to pick. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Oh, right, that's what you mean by multiple overwatches. I yeah. see. Okay, well, that makes sense. Yeah, and uh, I, we're not going to see, like, units kind of eating the overwatch the same way you know yeah. how like you'll charge with two you have to you're gonna have to uh, plan out your assaults a lot differently i think and yeah. it's uh it's gonna become more thinky this is the phase i'm really looking forward to i mean combat's kind of been playing second fiddle to shooting in the past couple editions mm -hmm. um and i really like combat heavy armies really putting the, the hurt on to people getting in close when we play 30k now like that's just i just love getting down and dirty with some fast moving Blade wielding, crazy cacophony and the fun stuff that I got. Um, <clears throat> so charge phase, you're charging in, which then brings you to the fight phase. And again, a moment of mourning for the initiative characteristic. It's I, gone. I'm really sad to see it go. Like I, I just think that that was a cool way to add character to models, like through the profile. But uh, I don't know. I'm not. I, I don't exactly know how to feel about it going away and that like huge change to uh, to the the assault phase. I like how it. I I do like initiative because as you said, it adds a little bit of character. So like this person's faster, they're they're mm -hmm. quicker. Um, I like how they've changed the fight phase. So essentially, what they have now is there's a three inch activation move before combat, essentially like the old initiative step pile in, except everybody kind of does it. Um, you can engage other units. You can pull other units into the combat. That's just what I was talking about earlier. If you've got a gunline army and you get in there, you get a three-inch move. You can pull another unit into that fight. Yeah, that's that's gonna make these like crazy multi-unit just melee morass of violence right in the middle of a board, and it is going to be bananas. But I think like tactically, blocking units. You know, if you've got a unit, let's use broadsides for example. You're going to want like a skirmish line of crew yeah. around them to make sure that that unit of broad size doesn't get pulled into like a corn juggerlord's assault. Honestly, the fact that you said the word crew, like, yeah. <laughs> look how revitalizing a could be. I know. Bringing the crew back. <laughs> and um, of course, the, the, uh, the implication of that is you, you actually can't overwatch against that unit that consolidates into you like that. Yeah. And yeah. so watch out. Watch and it, out. It, it makes a lot of sense because think about it in the swirling heat of battle you're not going to be like hey hey that that red demon's just cutting up my friend i'm just going to stand here and yeah. wait for that to finish you're going to charge in there and hit him with your rifle butt mm -hmm. or pulse try. gun butt yeah. <laughs> well because you certainly wouldn't shoot into there because you'd be shooting your own buddies exactly that might be yeah. part of the idea well yeah. orcs would do that <laughs> also also some imperial guard um 
So after, so instead of initiative, we have a different sort of um, way that combats are resolved. So charging units strike first, which is really big. Very yeah. different. It's we still don't know enough about the rules to know about like the super unwieldy things that we're used to, like power fists and thunder hammers. But you know, charging unit strikes first. It it makes sense. We might see units such as har- harlequins or howling banshees being like always strike first, and some other units might always have strike last. But right now, we're just making assumptions. We don't know. We're just excited. Yeah. Um, so after charging unit strike, so you do all your charges. You charging unit strike. Then each player takes turns activating a unit in combat, which is interesting and yeah. extremely tactical. That one, I, I'm i going to have a, like trouble like wrapping my head around. I'm the guy that like will be like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot that unit. Can I strike with it? And that, <laughs> this is only going to make me worse at that. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I'm... That's something that I'm going to have to like pay close attention to, but luckily this is like a really big rules change, so it's not like you're going to get that addition creep kind of messing you up. So I'm excited that it'll, it'll kind of solve this issue where every assault is really granular right now. What's at initiative step 10? What's yeah. at initiative step 7? It gets What's at initiative step 4, 3, 2, 1? And having to move... Uh, consolidate each of those pieces in at that certain time and just having it be really fiddly like that yeah Um, but i could totally see what you're saying because i will do that as well and just forget units or like did that one go already i can't remember maybe i have to do this unit next yeah and like i'm i'm also excited to see how challenges work with this because one of my favorite things to do was take a higher initiative uh challenge and like try and just you know, wipe that threat out before. Will it... there even be challenges? Oh god! Oh no! <laughs> oh! Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I haven't seen any rules for characters on any of the the data sheets we've been. We just know before. one truth about characters that we'll talk about in two weeks. Yeah. Um, that will inform a little bit about how challenges may or may not even work or exist. So, with the alternating combat, there's going to be a couple ways to get around it. We're going to get into one of them a little bit later in a, in a later episode um, with command points stri- striking out of sequence. <clears throat> but I also feel that different units are going to have, can always be activated first type rules. Or if you know, an opponent activates, then that one strikes simultaneously something like that to represent, to represent yeah. a more quicker unit. Because it doesn't make sense that a unit of Gretchen against... Striking Scorpion. Yeah. Gretchen is just going to beat them with the guns. <laughs> you know, if they get the jump on them. It's yeah. true. Like, I mean, fighting Gretchen is horrible. No one wants to nope. take a beating from the waist down. Like, that just seems awful. <laughs> no, that's the worst part to take a beating. <laughs> waist up. Waist up. <laughs> they call it above the belt for a reason. Oh. Um, and then the final big change, much like shooting, um, is fixed to hit rolls. I don't think, I don't know if you mentioned that, Paul, in, your, in what you were talking about with shooting, but. There's no more charts. Yeah. <laughs> the charts are gone. That's right. Your data sheet, which again, there'll be more on that later, uh, just has a set value. You need to get this roll in the dice or higher. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to be going over a, like, a multiplication table to see no. where my guys shoot at. Well, especially got annoying with ballistic skills 6, 7, and 8, right? Like, yeah. oh, I rolled a 1. That means I hit on a 6 or a 5 or a 4. Especially against playing against Mechanicus, where sometimes they're like, I'm Ballistic Skill 8. I was like, what? How? Why? But well, is there a downside to this fix to hit roll? I feel like Adam's, his eyes look crazy right now. I'm very passionate about this one. <laughs> this is my one gripe. I, I love everything 8th edition thus far, but my one gripe is the fixed weapon skill to hit rolls in combat. In my mind, the the... The guy, what do you you call him? The bloodthirster of corn, whose weapon skill 10 in the current edition uh, shouldn't shouldn't walk up to a grot and be able to hit him as easy as he could reboot Girly Man. (laughs) Like, there should be some levels, like, I'm I'm a very skilled fighter, so I walk up to a grot and I hit him on a 2. And that definitely needed to be a change to the weapon skill chart currently. Yeah. It needed to be more grot. But the grot shouldn't be able to hit a bloodthirster as easily as it can hit another grot. Exactly. This is my thing. Like, it doesn't... It... it, And, you know, we're going to have to wait and see how it plays out. But I... It kind of removes a cinematic feel. Like, you have these two evenly matched opponents. 
and you know you want that long epic fight you don't want every blow to land I think is kind of what you're saying it's totally the point yeah um, and then and more to the point is if you want the game to just go quicker and simplified uh, and you have a fist fixed to hit roll and then you're and you have a fixed to wound roll like in Age of Sigmar yeah you should just combine those two rolls together yeah and so Age of Sigmar instead of being like weapon skill hit on three always wound on two just take the average of those two rolls and put it together and yeah. have one roll. So we need D10s. <laughs> that's right. There you go. All right. That fixes all our problems. I promise that's all the negativity you're going to get from any of us for 8th yeah. edition. But I, yeah, I, I agree with you. It is a little weird, and I don't see how it's going to speed up the game. But, you know, we're still... We don't have a lot of the information. We're, uh, so this is my question based on this is, what kind of to-hit modifiers in combat will we see? I think you're going to see a bit. I think it's going to replace things like initiative. Yeah, like that's... I, as special rules come out, I think that is what's going to represent who's quicker. Like maybe Howling Banshees reduce your to hit roll because, mm-hmm. you know, their mask is screaming and that's really messed up. Well, you see it in, in even 30k if you look at some of the Legion specific rules in the Horus Heresy series. Uh, units like Night Lords, for example, if they outnumber somebody in combat, they get a plus one to hit, which yeah. means that even in 30k now, Night Lords can hit on a two. Yeah, like, the, I feel like some of the rules that we've seen in 30k have been, like, crypto testing grounds yeah. for, like, sort of uh, gameplay me- De- mechanics. They definitely have, yeah. Which is exciting. And, uh, you know, it uh, sets off the conspiracy theorist nut in me, which is always good. <laughs> Beautiful. So, guys, that wraps up um, our thoughts on the new 8th edition stuff. And this kind of just introduces movement, shooting, and combat. Very excited for next week where we will address some of the other things that have come out from Games Workshop. Um, and so let's move on to our fun time. Yeah, let's go have a fun time, you guys. So our fun time today is going to be uh, a piece of fluff that has been written by Mr. Paul, Mr. Fist Fowler himself, and read by Point and Click Nick. Uh, It is based on, and will actually kick off to, our upcoming 30K campaign between the Imperial Fists and the Emperor's Children. So Nick, why don't you go ahead and read that. Hello and welcome to the Masterpiece Theater. Today I'll be reading a selection from Mr. Fowler's personal collection, titled The Unbroken Oath. Fleetmaster Amon Vol strode from his quarters. His heavy foots rang throughout the halls. His armor was pitted and scored in dozens of places, but still perfectly serviceable. Behind him trailed his huskarl, Vito Sack, with Vool's rich red cloak piled in his arms and a pained expression across his face. My lord, your cape, cried the huskarl. Amon turned on his heel and fixed Vito with a perplexed stare, halting a human in his tracks. You may affix it during our victory parade, or my memorial, Vito, not before. Amon's voice was stern and commanding, but contained no malice. The impropriety of the fleet master at the helm of the unbroken oath without his full panoply of command chafed the Huskarl, and he looked at the fine cloak and then back to the fleet master. He began to voice a complaint, but when his gaze met the still confounded Amon, he thought better of it. Amon's expression relaxed just slightly. Vito, call my council and then meet us on the bridge. Vito acknowledged and returned to the quarters. He inspected the cloak as he hung it on the naked armor rack in the fleet master's room. It was burned and ripped, and had thick splashes of blood and grime across it. Only days ago, the Imperial Fists had repulsed an attack from the traitorous Emperor's children. The human had never considered that the Astartes would ever turn brother against brother, but in this new age of war he had learned that many, if not most impossibilities, were simply a matter of time. The horrors he had seen in the past years had shaken him to the core. In recent days he had seen great warriors boiled alive in their armor by ghastly psychocyonic weapons, the sound of which Vito would never forget. The bodies of the slain emperor's children were just as distressing, however their once fine and beautiful forms twisted to something far beyond the transhuman biology of the Astartes. There were even whispers of the traitors rendering the bodies of the dead, and perhaps still living, into perverse tinctures and potions. All of this swirled in mind, in Vito's mind, yet serving under the steady leadership of Amon Vul, had steeled his spirit again, and the bitter violence he had witnessed hammered his repulsion into hard and sharp hatred. 
Vito had served aboard the Unbroken Oath for nearly 30 years, under four different commanders, and in that time, not one had had such disdain for the tokens of office as Amon Vool. However, Vito had to admit that the Astartes mind for fleet craft was unparalleled. Still, Vito had certain expectations of the commander, and sighed deeply as he picked up the fleet master's command rod from the armor rack. It was enormous in his human hands. He thumbed the jeweled button which would alert Amon's council to meet. He then fastened the device to his belt and made for the bridge. The fleet master was surveying the data readouts on a vid screen from his command post when the council arrived. He stood as the four Astartes approached his post. Master of the Signal Chen and First Sergeant Karlstad arrived wearing only simple leather robes, while the formerly identical apothecaries Argo and Kainz were in full battle plate. Argo held his helmet under his arm to display his recent injuries as a perverse form of bragging. The apothecary's bottom jaw had been destroyed while repulsing the Emperor's children from the ship. He was able to communicate by use of a temporary vocalizer installed in his throat, but the wound was still ragged and ugly. Brothers, we have reached Dohan Secundus. Amon gestured to the vid screen. He reached his hand for the command rod that was supposed to hang at his side just as Vito entered the bridge. The Huskarl hustled over to the commander and handed him the command rod, as requested Lord Vool. Thank you, Huskarl. Amon allowed himself a brief smile, the first since the Emperor's children began harrowing the unbroken oath. It quickly faded. They had defeated the attackers. They were almost assuredly pursued. The oath was able to break off and flee to her destination, but at the cost of much of the Imperial Fist fleet as it was enveloped by the faster and more numerous traitor force. Brothers, we are under orders of Lord Dorn himself. We are to secure the relay stations on the ice moon. Amon's gaze fell to Sergeant Karlstad as he spoke of the moon's security. From there, the fleet master outlined their mission. They were to secure the communication station both on the moons and on the planet. Dohan Secundus would then act as a staging area for Imperial forces, and its orbital shipyards would be invaluable to the fleets drawing away from Horus's main thrust towards Terra. Vito watched as the reflection of his master's face in the vid screen turned stony. Everyone on the bridge of the Unbroken Oath knew that the savage predators of the Emperor's children still swam in the cold void and hunted them with hungry intensity. To himself, the Huskarl mouthed the words, For Dorn, for the Emperor. This has been, and will remain, Paul Mr. Fist Fowler, Point and Click Nick, and Adam Truax, the truest axe to ever axe an axe. And thanks for joining us, and check back again soon for some more 40k goodness. And remember, it's just inches and cubes.